Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Planning and Implementation a Carcass Disposal Site in Minnesota. Please note that all lines will be muted for the duration of the call. We will have a Q&A portion at the end, and we will provide you in with instructions on how to ask a question at that time. You can also direct all questions to the chat panel, all questions throughout the conference to the chat panel in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, so just make sure you have that open if you have any questions during the conference, and they will be read during the end. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Lucy Hunt graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a BS in Entomology and Conservation Biology. With that background, she worked as the first program manager for Ohio's nascent Emerald Ash Borer Response before coming to Minnesota to manage the Gypsy Moth Program at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. In 2014, Lucy changed course from life science to earth science and started managing the on-call team, responding to pesticide and fertilizer spills, fish kills, and improper disposal of ag chemicals. In 2015, she was part of the state response to Minnesota's highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. Since that introduction to the convergence of emergency response and foreign animal diseases, she has assisted the Department's Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response by building and training an IMT, supporting agricultural industry preparedness planning and exercises, and most recently acting as the incident commander for the state's agricultural response to livestock supply chain disruptions due to COVID-19. She is now the acting director of the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And with that, I will turn the um, webinar over to our speaker, Lucy Hunt. Thank you so much, Liz, for that introduction. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in today. Many states have been planning for carcass disposal in the event of a foreign animal disease, um, but this year we had an opportunity to put our plans into action for a different kind of scenario that required the same um, immediate attention. We knew initially here in Minnesota that grinding and composting would be our primary solution um, for this carcass disposal since we have composting experts on staff and we also have contractors who are very experienced in composting um, from the 2015 HPAI outbreak. We also like the grinding and composting method um, because it's very fast, has a low environmental contamination risk, and it takes up far less space than some of the other options. But in addition to implementing this method, we did keep really close track of disposal capacity um, at our major regional renderers um, as they ramped up operations. And we also explored the potential for um, incinerating carcasses in our waste to energy garbage inc incinerators, but discussions with the energy companies um, continued and they declined to do any test runs to determine burn rates, air quality issues, or capacity. Um, we also worked with our state environmental regulators to determine landfill capacities and associated tipping fees. And landfills were used to some extent by producers, but whole carcasses require special treatment, special equipment, and planning that many landfills were just not able to support on such short notice. So, and also suitable deep burial sites in Minnesota are few and far between with our high water tables. So that disposal method was quickly rejected as a state option, although individuals were free to pursue it um, on their own. We set up a carcass disposal hotline so producers could talk through some of these um, different options with experts at the Board of Animal Health. And we found that just as often they turned to their county officials for help and advice um, on that subject. So let's get started talking more about the grinding and composting activities here in Minnesota. Um, just a little background here. Uh, Minnesota is the number two hog producing state in the nation, behind only Iowa in production. Hog farms here are really concentrated in the southern third of the state and along the South Dakota border. Martin County is our top producing county with over 150 hog farms, um, and they have titled themselves the bacon capital of the USA. 
Now, Marquette County sits just about equidistant between Minnesota's two largest pork processing plants, JDS in Worthington, which is two counties west, and Quality Pork slash Hormel in Austin, which is about three counties east. COVID-19 outbreaks in meatpacking plants this spring caused widespread illness and absenteeism among the workforce and forced plant closures. Um, meat production, as you might know, follows a just-in-time business model. So the hogs destined for the plants couldn't go there, but they also couldn't stay in their barns and take up valuable floor space meant for younger pigs. The Hormel plant never closed completely, but on April 13th, the Smithfield pork processing plant just across the border in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, closed indefinitely. This plant takes um, over 19,000 hogs a day, and around 30% of those are Minnesota animals. So that's a major hit to our producers. Then a week later, on the April 20th, um, the JBS plant just inside the state border, which normally slaughters around 21,000 hogs a day, experienced a similar COVID outbreak and closed. And nationwide, uh, pork processing capacity was reduced to around 55% by early May. So the Minnesota Department of Health, I'm sorry, Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the Board of Animal Health um, stood up their incident management team at this time to really address and take a closer look at the impact of these and other plant closures on Minnesota's livestock and poultry producers. Um, to alleviate some of the market pressure, uh, while undergoing deep cleaning in the processing area, JBS opened its kill floor and, um, for, the, for some growers, and they were able to run through about 3,000 head a day just for euthanization. Uh, most of the carcasses went to rendering, but about a third of them were hauled um, for other disposal, namely at our disposal site. Um, so I will get into that a little bit here. And I also, as more background, I wanted to tell you about some recent experience that we had. Today it seems almost prescient, but um, earlier this year in February, we demonstrated a cold weather composting trial on the windy plains of southwestern Minnesota. Uh, we used coal market hogs and heater pigs challenged with purrs. Um, we ground and piled the compost in three rows under three treatments. One treatment was mixed with wood chips. One was mixed with corn stalks or corn silver. And one was a mixture between the wood and the corn silver. We really wanted to see if this composting method would be usable to us um, in a cold winter climate like Minnesota's. So in addition to the composting process, we studied the fate of a surrogate virus, the water quality of the leachate from underneath the pile. And um, it turned out that uh, temperature graphs from the study showed normal heat cycles in all three treatments. And so we were really confident that composting could happen in, in Minnesota. Most importantly, however, the exercise brought together producers and the pork industry representatives the state and our contractors. We had an idea of how to make the process work, but this was the day when the rotochopper people determined the size of the grinder we needed, the contractors discovered they needed some extra equipment, the producers saw how quickly carcasses disappeared, and the state learned what it would take to put all this together. But of course, at the top of everyone's mind then was one thing, and that was African swine fever. But that was a great backdrop for us to start um, our composting here. Before jumping into any solutions uh, for the COVID-19 crisis, of course, always the matter of funding. We applied for FEMA with no luck, and USDA wasn't releasing funds for non-animal disease events. So we turned to the Minnesota legislature um, that just happened to still be in session. Our legislature created the COVID-19 Minnesota Fund and appropriated money in the fund for state agencies to use to protect Minnesotans from the COVID-19 outbreak itself, and also to maintain state government operations throughout the duration of our peacetime emergency. Requests over $1 million had to be approved by a legislative commission, 
our request exceeded $10 million, but still gained approval from the commission. They thought it was that important. Um, and once those funds were transferred over to our account, we were ready to issue a work order on the state emergency response contract. So based on their knowledge um, from the February demonstration, our contractors estimated costs to operate one centralized disposal site would be around $74,000 per day, including equipment rental, fuel and maintenance, um, operators for the equipment, carbon sources, portatons and site sanitation, and also site personnel. Um, a little bit more about our contractors here. Uh, we use our state emergency response contract at the department to clean up routine spills of ag chemicals, um, to store and maintain our poultry depopulation equipment, and also we exercise with them for our foreign animal disease responses. On April 30th, uh, a work order was issued on the contract to West Central Environmental Consultant. Um, the work order outlined several broad functions that we expected them to complete, and they really took care of the rest. By May 2nd, um, the site was up and running and accepted its first load of 1,000 hogs in that very first day. Now, we needed a place to set up the um, dispos centralized disposal site and quickly. Um, all of this came together really fast. Um, our rush to locate a plot of land ended with a 1,000 acre site available in a prime location right near Worthington and the JBS plant. Um, the state drafted up a lease agreement with the owner and once we got the verbal okay on that, we began setting up the site around May 1st. On May 11th, a second site was located um, in the more eastern part of the state uh, in Lesseur County. The owner approached the MDA because he was hearing about the pig backups in the news and already owned a roto chopper for his wood pallet recycling business. We worked with those landowners and their lawyer to come up with a detailed compensation agreement. And in addition to using his land, that owner also acted as a sub to our contractor operating his own equipment, so he was able to earn some extra money as well that way. And we'll see the terms of the agreement, which were both written up a little bit differently, but tend to, they kind of equal out in the end. Owners get to keep all of the compost produced on their site, and they can spread and incorporate it on their own. The Lesseur agreement contains more long-term language, uh, about the land rental for storage of excess compost because the owner has a smaller total area to spread on and he was worried that he wouldn't be able to get it down all in one year. The sites, I'm gonna call them Nobles County and Lesseur. Um, we did not treat the locations as confidential, but we didn't advertise their precise locations any more than naming the county they were in. Um, the, the Nobles County down in the southwest part of the state, that grinding location was chosen um, because it had decent road access, uh, but the grinding equipment and animal carcasses could be delivered to a gentle depression in the land, which made the operations mostly invisible to passersby. And that privacy was very important to us. The Latour site in eastern, um, the eastern side had a private access road and more perimeter trees to block the view and was also on, on higher ground. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, our environmental regulators, gave us some criteria to follow to reduce the risk of contaminating surface and groundwater with our compost. We located the piles at least 200 feet from a drinking water supply, um, at least 200 feet from surface water, karst features, common in Minnesota springs and open tile inlets. And also at least 50 feet from drainage swales that would lead to a water body. The wells, tile intakes, and surface water at both sites um, were well outside these setbacks. And the topography was also flat enough that concentrated runoff from the compost tiles was not expected to be an issue. 
Now, in late April, you'll recall the NRCS came into play offering EPRIP grants to assist producers with costs associated with disposal, including um, composting. So working that into our system raised a couple of challenges. One, the disposal sites needed to be pre-approved by NRCS, so that meant they had to approve our existing centralized disposal sites. Two, uh, it wasn't fair to let producers get reimbursed for composting costs if the state was already picking up the tab. So we worked it out that uh, producers would only receive compensation for the transportation part. And third, NRCS was not originally part of our IMT, so it took a little bit of time to make that connection and start working together. And it's telling that my previous slide was about setting the terms of the agreement, and only later did we formalize the site selection process with the help and expertise of NRCS. So our combined list of site suitability criteria became focused on access, privacy, um, the space available, and water management to protect both surface and groundwater. Now the field teams with the NRCS used soil survey maps to get a general feel for the types of soils present um, in both areas and followed up with on-site borings to verify the soil structure there. Uh, where the composting was taking place. So here the soils map on the screen that I'm showing is from the Lissor site. And the, the three photos underneath show the, um, their borings, showing that the, there is predominantly loam and clay soils in the area, which did meet their criteria for reduced permeability. And I'm going to take you for a little tour on both of the sites. Um, the Southwest Minnesota site down in Nobles County had a gravel access pad off the main highway, and delivery vehicles were routed around a one-way loop. And you can see on this map that the traffic first passed by the carbon source pile, then the grinding area there in red, and finally the carcass drop zone before heading back out. We did not require any washing stations set up for biosecurity because this wasn't a disease event. Now, I mentioned that depression earlier, although the, dis the site afforded privacy, uh, the very first rain that for that rainstorm there uh, meant that for several days, the site was nearly impossible to access with um, semi-tractor trailers for the delivery of car carbon and carcasses. So at one point, the site was closed for nearly a week while it dried out. And you'll see the compost windrows here set up in an array for easy access. Um, this map doesn't show the topographic mines, but water generally drain, drain toward the south. So knowing what we know now, um, we should have uh, oriented the east-west piles differently because they were basically acting as giant berms that were keeping the water from draining. The two northern tiles oriented at an angle had fewer issues with water pooling. And moving over to Lesore, the Lesore site over in southeast Minnesota, um, this was on higher ground and intended to have better drainage in general. The whole site slopes to the west, um, but you can see toward the top of this map some darker weather spots that we just avoided. Um, building the piles on. Traffic from the, at this site had to come a ways off the main highway, but the road structure was really good enough to allow two-way traffic for easier maneuvering uh, by delivery drivers. And you'll see later the contractor here laid swamp mats on this site to stabilize the ground a little bit better um, in the areas that were receiving the heaviest traffic. Carbon sources um, were a major issue, although we couldn't be sure about the number of pigs being depopulated in the state. We knew we would need many tons of carbon for the composting operations. Um, and sourcing companies, uh, we looked at our plant protection, our composting and logging industries, and this wide range of contacts allowed us to build a really comprehensive statewide listing of sources and also get really good pricing and location information to make wise choices with our money. 
we asked firms to fill out an online form uh, with their contact information, products available, and delivery capabilities. And their responses were then logged into a Google Sheet, uh, which was displayed on the Board of Animal Health website for public use. Um, we knew other people were exploring this option as well. We used a similar process to gather information on hauling companies for dead and livestock and for grinders, although we didn't publicize the results of the grinding due to the sensitive nature of that topic. And I mentioned corn stalks used in our winter demo, but springtime in Minnesota is really the wrong time of year to find excess hay or straw or stover. Um, Woodchips, however, are pretty plentiful in this area, especially after a winter of timber harvesting and brush clearing. So using our procurement list, the contractor negotiated with firms all over Minnesota and northern Iowa to secure a steady flow of chips into both sites, always, of course, keeping in mind the movement restrictions for gypsy moth and emerald ash borer. Um, another issue along these lines arose when we discovered that northern Minnesota chip shipments um, could violate weight limits on our state roads. Weight limits are necessary to prevent undue wear and tear on roads that are subject to um, a severe freeze thaw cycle. So we requested the governor issue an executive order to extend weight limits as well as hours of service for our drivers who are hauling carbon sources um, as well as livestock and carcasses. And let's talk about the equipment that we use. Uh, Rototoppers, pictured here, are a line of high volume diesel powered grinders that are sold mostly for making mulch, animal bedding, or engineered wood fiber products. Um, manufactured right here in central Minnesota in the town of St. Martin, we have the advantage of experts right here uh, for mechanical or maintenance advice. The folks over at RoboChopper also helped us find the appropriate models to, to use and to rent close to our sites. This B6, B66 model horizontal grinder I'm showing here has a 750 horsepower engine, uh, which is plenty big. We started out with using double six inch screens on the, on the feed, and we did keep some larger eight inch screens handy um, in case the six inch screens plugged up too fast, but we found those um, six inches to be working just fine and they were used for the duration at both sites. I mentioned the weight restrictions limits on the last slide, but unfortunately those were not in place in time to haul this overweight, oversized machine down to the site. So we had to get an expedited permit to, to transport it over the road. Uh, throughput on this machine was sustainable at 100,000 pounds of carcasses an hour. And that was after getting this machine sort of dialed in and getting the equipment operators into a groove. At 300 pounds per animal, we calculate we could have done um, over 2,000 2, animals in a day. Of course, barring any equipment breakdowns or malfunctions and having plenty of carbon available. Demand never reached that high. Um, it only peaked around 1,000 carcasses per day. Um, another maintenance note on this piece of equipment, the horizontal grinder had to be cleaned daily or else um, the conveyor deactivates due to weight buildup in the, underneath the belt. This is a built-in security function that we discovered. And then our excavator. We used the 200D model um, with that thumb attachment on the bucket, and that was to feed those carcasses into the grinder. With the thumb assist, one scoop from this machine could pick up to five 300-pound animal carcasses. The equipment basically sat in one position all day, swinging one way to pick up and the other to drop. The operators took a few hours to get used to the motion um, and to the technique, but quickly became very skilled in picking up the carcasses without mangling them. At one point, due to a scheduling error, some long dead carcasses were brought to one of the sites, and those had to be handled um, with extra care by an experienced operator to get them loaded whole onto the grinder. 
Um, as time went on, this excavator was eventually replaced with a smaller model, and we did not see any loss or reduction in efficiency. So you could definitely start with a smaller model first. And onto our smaller equipment, um, we used front end loaders and tracked skid steers at the sites as well. This is really versatile equipment, and this was used for many functions, including making the carbon base layer, feeding the carbon into the grinder, constructing compost windrows, taps, topping piles, turning and combining compost piles, and unfortunately, too often, pulling out stuck vehicles and equipment. In addition to all of this mobile equipment, we kept a pressure washer unit on, with onboard water source at each site for daily cleaning and sanitation. There were also ATVs and pickup trucks at both sites for personnel transport, accessing remote areas, and taking uh, compost pile readings. And I do want to show you, I have a, a video clip here um, about how all that equipment worked together. So maybe we can run that video. I'm going to turn off the wind there. So you uh, but just imagine you're in a very windy environment in southwest Minnesota. Um, carcasses here have been delivered to the Noble site. The grinder sits atop a layer of wood chips that absorb any stray carcass fluids. And you can see the front end loader here has pre-mixed the carcasses with wood chips. A front end loader comes to pick up a load from the pile and transfers it over to the windrow. You'll see a walking floor trailer here that's delivering additional wood chips. And coming back to the grinding area, the excavator here grabs several carcasses and lifts them onto the conveyor bed of the grinder. On the far side of the roto chopper, a skid steer drops bucketfuls of wood chips um, onto the conveyor, and they are run simultaneously to form a mixed pile at the outfall. So that is, um, that was the noble site. Okay, I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Thank you. Um, to make sure that we didn't end up with a huge stockpile of carcasses, we knew we had to come up with a scheduling system. The, the, daily present, the daily schedule shown here is an example of the spreadsheet that we used. <clears throat> the IMT set up a system using Google Sheets and granted access to the contractors, which turned out to be extremely helpful for them. This allowed deliveries to be spread out so that carcasses didn't pile up all at, once at the site. And we estimated the number of carcasses in a load and tried to match that with the speed of the grinder so there was just a continuous supply. We made every attempt to maintain flexible business hours if a system was planning depopulations, but at the same time, we wanted to treat all producers equally and keep access available for everyone. For example, some systems carrying out large-scale depopulations took most of the slots some days, but we tried to reserve time slots for independent producers on those with single loads. Now, the image on the right is the form that we came up with to connect the scheduling group and the contractors. Drivers had to fill this form out and present it at the front gate of the compost site. We found that drivers didn't always adhere to their scheduled drop time, or sometimes they failed to communicate with us if a load wasn't coming at all. And so we'll have to devise a better system of communication for the future. The graph here I'm showing at the bottom of the screen um, uh, tracks the number of market weight equivalent carcasses we received. Now, most of the animals brought to our sites were around 300 pound hogs but occasionally we would get a load of smaller pigs, and we didn't want to rep misrepresent our throughput with um, larger numbers of small pigs. 
so we evened them out. Um, and the yellow lines you see there are breeder turkey carcasses that we accepted from a poultry system experiencing market disruptions, um, same as on the pork side. We did have questions from producers whether they could bring animals in from other states uh, to dispose of at our sites. But we decided that um, we would only allow animals um, owned by Minnesota taxpayers, seeing as how the sites were funded by taxpayers. And I do want to talk about the composting part at this point. Um, there's a lot of technical issues around composting, and I am not a composting expert, so I'm not going to go into a lot of those details. But I'll let you know about some of the ways we constructed ours to deal with the site conditions. Here's just a simple cross section diagram of a compost pile, showing the base layer, the core mixture, and a cap. And rows built like this could stretch on for 600 feet at our sites. We'll start first looking at the base layer. The prepared base layer shown in this slide is 18 to 24 inches thick, and it consists of coarsely ground wood chips. The base layer should be constructed of larger wood chips um, to allow for a good air circulation throughout the pile. The material you see here is still loose enough to breathe um, even after the equipment has rolled over it. And I would like to point out that there were two on-site wood chip stockpiles, one up by the grinder to feed in the carbon uh, with the carcasses, and one situated closer to the windrows to lay the space and cap layers. This just reduced the traveling need for motors, and it was really essential on large projects like this. The inset photo here shows a trailer unloading chips at the second wood chip pile in Noble County. And moving on to the core, um, obviously, and in our case, literally, the core is the meat of the compost pile. This is where all the microbial action happens to break down the animal carcasses, as long as there's plenty of food for them to eat, plenty of air for them to breathe, and adequate moisture to dry them. The core mixture is an approximately one-to-one -one ratio of carcasses to wood chips. Now, the chips absorb a great deal of the fluids to uh, prevent excess leachate and also keep that needed moisture within the pile. The core material was picked up at the outfall of the grinder and transported over to the windrows. You can see here in this inset photo that they really load up that bucket um, for the trip, but a caveat is that the road is pretty bumpy, and you can imagine chips and hunks falling loose from the bucket, leaving a trail of core material um, stretching from one end to the next. We learn to and highly recommend paying close attention to site sanitation every day and picking up these stray materials to avoid excessive fly and odor issues. And finally, arriving at the cap. The compost cap is constructed by piling wood chips to the over the core to a depth of 12 to 18 inches. Now, I thought a clever solution was figuring out how, how thick that they were making this. The contractors stuck these orange sticks out of the piles to the appropriate depth and gave equipment operators a visual on how deep they needed to build the cap. This capping layer is extremely important. It really provides a protective covering over the top of the core um, to reduce odors and to retain enough moisture within the pile to not dry out. The cap layer is generally a lighter grind of carbon material for this reason. Um, the photo I'm showing here is from Nobles County was taken in mid-May, and there are no visible windmills at this site, but this is a part of Minnesota that has basically continuous wind blowing, often gusting up to 30 to 40 miles an hour. Um, we were afraid that using any lighter ground material would be, as a cap, would get blown away instantly. So we continued to use the heavier and bigger wood chip sizes for the cap. <clears throat> However, we did experience some odor and fly problems here at the site. And um, we got some advice to change the recipe of our cap capping layer to include some finer grind um, material that could settle in and form a better barrier. Unfortunately, this was pretty close to the time when demand slowed um, considerably and the new structure was not fully implemented. But that's something we'll start with next time. 
I do want to mention um, wildlife and vermin control at this time. At our winter demo, we set up a series of trail cameras to catch any predatory intruders in the act and came up empty. Now, late winter in Minnesota is a time of year when wild animals are at their coldest and hungriest. So if they didn't bother with those warm, tasty piles then, we weren't too concerned that they would bother with these during the summer. And once you have a, a compost windrow constructed properly, then the monitoring begins. Generally, we saw temperatures spike within hours, um, and our contractors checked each row at 50 to 100 foot intervals, depending on how long the row was, for just a couple days to make sure the compost process was getting started correctly. Now, as a rule of thumb, the piles can be turned after about two weeks, so to check and make sure, Temperatures were taken again for a few days around that two-week mark. Um, and once the pattern developed and showed that temperatures were decreasing, the piles could then be turned. Now, there was no need to turn piles twice, but once the temps started decreasing for the second time, another two weeks later, um, the piles were consolidated. Easy to do because they lost so much volume in the composting process. Now, at this point in Nobles County, the ground was still pretty soggy during, um, so during consolidation, we just up and moved all the piles up to higher ground. Overall, our pile tents stayed within the 128 to 162 degree range, which is completely acceptable. Remember that about 120 degrees is the temperature needed to kill viruses, and this particular graph shows this pile was above 120 degrees for the better part of a month. The piles themselves had a lifespan from start to finish of about four to six weeks. I would also mention that these larger wood chips um, do not fully decompose after one composting cycle. And we suspect that they could be recycled um, with more carcasses to go through another, maybe even two more composting cycles. The finished compost is then left in the hands of the landowners according to our lease agreements. Compost can be a wonderful soil amendment and provide some nutrient value. So both the landowners and county officials want to know what this material contains exactly so they can calculate land spreading rates and also ensure that no contaminants are settling into the environment. We have not, uh, done any of the analysis yet, but we will most likely follow the seal of testing assurance program recommendations. The STA program is used by many commercial composters here in our state, and analyses not only fulfill the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency requirements, but also look at a few more compounds of interest. We'll be looking at nutrients um, as well as physical composition components, um, for other piles. We'll have to follow the STA's standardized sampling instructions um, for how to take the compost samples, but expect to have results back later this summer, and we'll be happy to share them with this community. The third category here, PFAS, which would require separate testing, but according, again, to the Pollution Control Agency, PFAS are a major issue for compost sites and they're trying to identify how much PFAS is in the leachate and in finished compost. Now, you may know PFAS uh, contaminates our groundwater and it gets taken up by plants. It bioaccumulates in animals, and so they're interested to know if we find more PFAS in animal composting than in regular household composting programs. So we would need to do a site analysis for PFAS to make sure that it's the compost, not the environment itself, that is the source. And I want to take you um, across the state now that we've talked to about what goes into creating the centralized disposal site. Um, I want to share this video from the Lassure site. It's a little bit longer video, um, but it really shows uh, the really good overview of the activities per site.
you'll see trucks here pulling up to the site via the private drive. And maybe notice that he's backing up onto the swamp mats placed strategically at the tipping area. To minimize ruts and to stabilize the trailer when it's at its most unstable position. This is a end dump trailer. The carcasses are dumped um, close to the grinder. And you can get a clear shot from here um, of the conveyor bed of the grinder and how exactly the excavator and loader work together to mix the carcasses and carbon. Now here, instead of pre-mixing the carcasses with wood chips like we saw at the Noble site, um, here we are using a conveyor to create a bed of chips um, in the bed of the grinder, um, putting a layer of carcasses on top, and then topping that off with another layer of wood chips. And that's all run through the grinder at once to make sure we get a really good mixture at the outfall. Another delivery of wood chips was just accepted. You saw that truck pulling in. Um, they'll back up and they're gonna be dumping at the secondary um, carbon pile for use in the base and top layers. The carcasses here are just being um, dumped out of the, the rear end of that trailer. You can see over to the left the prepared base layer and um, the contractors prepared um, many feet of those for the next for the next um, work day. So they were they always had a place to put the core mixture um, that was being processed. So as this um, dump trailer finishes um, depositing its load, you can see those skid steers moving into action. They will push all of those carcasses up closer to the excavator, um, get them off those swamp mats for uh, the next delivery. And here comes the front end loader grabbing a, a bucket full of that core mixture, and he'll take that over to the windrow piles um, off the screen. So you can see it, there's a lot going on at one of these sites, and it takes a lot of coordination to figure out how everybody's moving without running into each other. Um, I will have to give our compliments to our contractors for making this all happen so smoothly. Um, between the two sites here, like, just like this, you know, happening every day, we composted over 20,000 pig carcasses, and again, that's market weight equivalent, um, and nearly 19,000 breeder turkeys. So we were pretty busy. All right, thank you, and let's see. I, I do want to talk about everybody's favorite subjects, which is complaints. Um, we actually see, received very few complaints 
about the compost site. We didn't have any security issues or activist trespassing problems. Um, the contractors manned an entry gate at each site, and they only allowed authorized vehicles. The contractors, drivers, and visitors in, in, at the site were all warned not to take or share video or photos of the site or operations. In fact, even some <clears throat> media were denied access after approaching the landowners. We did notify our county emergency managers about the sites and asked sheriffs to conduct occasional drive-bys, especially after hours or, or through the evening. When I offered um, tours, site tours to local officials, they all declined saying it was just too depressing because they all either are or know hog farmers. One site neighbor, although he understood and sympathized with the problem, complained that his yard was unusable because of the strong odor and the flies emanating from the compost area. He had hired an applicator to spray his lot for flies, which gave him some temporary relief. So uh, to be good neighbors, we also hired an aerial applicator to knock down fly populations at both sites. This seemed to be um, quite reasonably priced and quite effective, and we only had to do that once to really gain um, good control. As I mentioned before, although the Nobles County site afforded really good privacy, those rains um, made access really hard and also caused a lot of water pooling uh, between our compost piles. So kind of had a lot of anaerobic decomposition going on as well, and that does get stinky. So um, the next time we'll make sure to uh, pay better attention to site drainage and orient our piles um, according to those site needs. Uh, another complaint we had, a different neighbor, was very concerned about water quality in their drinking water well. Um, and this is where that NRCS report came in very handy and where I relied not only on our site selection criteria and state regulations, but also on the reputation and qualifications of that trusted third party with their comprehensive report. Um, now, it what, uh, we had to end up closing our sites. Um, the poor site conditions at, at Nobles <clears throat> and seemingly endless rainstorms over the area um, prompted us to close down that site on June 30th. Although the Lestor site was running smoothly and had fewer water issues, um, we really couldn't justify keeping the site open without any carcasses scheduled. Our, our carpet supply um, dropped off drastically in early to mid-June. Um, so the Lestoria site is now considered suspended, not closed, in the event we have an, another un uptick in need. Um, the equipment owner operator at the Lestoria site has his wood recycling business right across the street. So restarting up the site um, should be very quick for us. The last report, as we're you know watching the, um, the pig backlog situation, it looks pretty favorable for the foreseeable future, um, barring any other resurgence of COVID-19 in the uh, processing plants themselves. To close the site um, really involved simply thoroughly cleaning all of the equipment. Um, we washed everything with those power washers, um, did use some um, detergents as needed, and returning all of the rentals. Our contractor and composting experts still return to the sites for windrow monitoring and turning or combining activities. Those aren't all completely done yet. Um, currently, there are still piles actively composting at both sites that will be needing attention in the coming weeks. And I just want to recap some of the lessons learned throughout this process. Um, I wish we had known, like I said, to bring the NRCS team into the, into the process earlier. They might have steered us differently, but having them as a resource was extremely helpful. 
Um, our state environmental agency was on the IMT from the start, but their regulatory authority um, ended at just giving us their site selection guidance. Second, I mentioned the communications with the haulers in case they were no-shows. Um, we'll be sending out a uh, satisfaction survey to producers who use the, the service next week. Um, and, we'll be, and we'll see if they have any other suggestions for us to uh, implement for the next time. Now, um, the fly and odor issues, we've all been taught that a well-constructed compost pile shouldn't have odor and fly problems. But we learned that with just sitting on the ground like that, the water piling up, um, I, I talked about some of the, the lessons learned about uh, reorienting or moving those piles. So, so that we can reduce our fly and odor issues. The excess wood chips, um, we really did have a very good idea of how many producers would be taking advantage of the program. Uh, so we really just had to plan for the worst. We brought in many tons of wood chips to both sites. And now with the rather sudden drop in demand, we're left with a lot left over. Um, we'll continue to use the chips to soak up liquids after combining piles and cleaning up the equipment, but we'll have to consider how to get rid of the excess. Uh, compost spreading is another issue uh, that we're just dealing with now. What to do with it all? There is a lot that was generated. Our landowner in Nobles County owns a total of 1,000 acres, so he'll have no trouble incorporating that. Um, but those uh, sites with, a, with less land available are going to have some trouble. I mentioned our total cost estimate initially came coming in around $74,000 per day. Um, about 60% of that cost is wood chips. And so with the lower number of carcasses run through a day, um, we figured our daily rate was about $45,000 a day. So that gives us a better idea about where we're going to be going in the future. Our official after action review is scheduled for next week with the team, um, with our agency executives and with our contractors. So we'll talk over what went well, um, what went poorly and how we envision a future response. We'll use this information to inform our response plan uh, for foreign animal diseases and hope to be able to translate a lot of these lessons into better practice um, for a foreign animal disease event. That is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Lucy. We do have a lot of questions for you in the chat box. Um, and if Adam would like to give you directions if somebody wants to ask a verbal question. Yeah, no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a verbal question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. And at that time, please then just state your name and question. And once again, that's pound two if you wish to ask a verbal question. And in the meantime, I'll go ahead and start with the chat questions. Um, the first one was, you mentioned after NRCS was involved, the producer was reimbursed for transport, not composting, because the state was funding that. Did Minnesota receive any compensation from NRCS for the disposal costs? No, we didn't, and we didn't pursue it. Okay. The next question is, when turning the pile, do you turn the entire layers of the compost site? Yep, the whole, the whole pile was turned over. Um, this, uh, we had to mix up um, fresh base and cap and make sure that we were not setting um, core material straight on the ground. So uh, we did mix up the whole thing. We didn't leave those base layers um, intact. They came up with everything and kind of got mixed into the whole um, shebang of the, of the second turning. The next question is, do you have the results of the PFAS assessments, both of the site and of the compost? I don't. Um, I'm very interested in that. We have not taken any of our samples yet. Um, that's one of our, our upcoming projects to do to make sure we get all of those. Those um, PFAS, um, that's an acronym. I, I guess I forgot to explain that. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, these are some man-made substances um, that were manufactured and used in a variety of industries. 
Um, so they're just, we're just finding them in strange parts of the environment. And so trying to find them, they're very persistent, um, both in the environment and the human body. So um, these are pretty, getting to be pretty important in both human and environmental health. So we'll be taking a pretty close look at those. How easy would it be to clean and disinfect the grinder? The grinder, um, uh, they, when we were in our winter demo, you know, they had a, um, they had some virus challenged animals go through the grinder. They used um, hot water pressure washers to clean that off. And I believe that they did some swatting of the equipment afterward and didn't find any, um, any virus left over on that. So I think a very careful power washing will do the trick. Um, what they did is when they washed it, they put down a bed of a layer of chips, so all that wash water would soak into the chips, and then they would compost those chips um, with the tiles. The next question is, were any walking floor trailers used for the carcasses, and did you have any of the dump trailers fall over? Um, I don't think that any of them jump, fell over, but I've seen some pictures of some at a very precarious uh, angle. So the frameless end dump trailers were the most unstable, and I think those stability mats that they used in the store were quite helpful for those. Um, I didn't hear of any accidents, um, and I think most of the carcasses that we got in were, came in dump trailers. The walking floor trailers were used um, solely for the wood chips. The next question is, were odors during the grinding operation a concern? As we looked to set up a site, that was one of our main concerns. Odors, um, odors were a, a big concern. One of the big, um, I guess, sources of the odor were not necessarily the compost piles themselves, but like I mentioned, the trail of uncomposted materials from the grinder outfall to the windrows um, generated a lot of, of odors. And also, they started cleaning the equipment daily, um, using that power washer daily to make sure that there's nothing hung up in those in the equipment itself that would give off um, unpleasant odors. So that seemed to control both the odors and the flies quite a bit, just that, site, that simple site sanitation. The next question is, were the flies breeding on the site or just attracted to the site? If there was breeding, was the hatch coming out of the windrow or just the excess material that just did not get into the windrow? Um, that's a good question. I don't think anybody um, looked close, that closely to see um, if there were maggots actually in the piles. Um, I did not hear any reports of that, although I did hear um, from some of our county officials down in southwest Minnesota that flies in general were pretty bad this year. Um, so I'm thinking it's more of an attraction issue than, um, than a reproductive site. Okay, so this one has three questions. The first one is, did the grower or company take care of the bee pot? They all did. We had no uh, responsibilities for depopulation at this time, and um, they could depopulate them in any way they had. I mentioned the, the JBS kill floor, which was open for a couple weeks, um, so some were depopulated that way. Some were depopulated um, by gunshot. Some came in depopulated um, from ventilation shutdown plus heat plus humidity. Um, so we had a variety of ways that the pigs were depopulated, but we didn't really ask um, or keep track of who was doing what. Okay. What was the average number of head in a delivery to the site? I want to say it was one of those um, trailers that you saw in the video. That was about 150, 300 pound um, head. They could uh, get those loaded up pretty pretty good in one of those trailers. And I think they got about 150 of them because we had them, they could, the throughput was about 300 per hour. So we had those trucks scheduled every half hour. So it was about 150. Okay. Have you considered allowing the producers who dispose of the carcasses have access to the cooked compost? 
Um, no, actually, it would just be it'd be too difficult to divide up compost piles according to who wanted it. I I think if they wanted to use some, they could approach uh, you know the the landowners to sort of make a deal um, if they wanted to buy or even take some of it. But we didn't broker any of those agreements. Okay. Any significant issues with excess fluids from the roto chopper process? That is a surprisingly clean process. Um, I was I was kind of amazed by by how clean that was. What they'll do, uh, the wood chips really soak up quite a bit of the, the body fluids from those carcasses as they're going through, um, and uh, and so and what they would do uh, sort of at the end of the day was run um, maybe a load of just dry chips through to sort of clean off the hammers and the insides of the equipment. Uh, but we really didn't have a lot of, of fluid issues around the grinder. Okay, the next question is, you mentioned a list of criteria for selection of a composting site, many involving proximity to surface water. We're in a low-lying coastal area with a high water table. Where can I access detailed site selection guidance, especially WRT groundwater? That's a very good question. We went to our um, our state uh, pollution control agency had all of that because they deal with commercial composters. Of course, some of their requirements were put it on a concrete pad, which was unfeasible for us. So if I were you, I would talk to your state environmental uh, agency and, um, and ask them what, what the criteria are for your particular situation. Does your state allow blanket composting with land application of mammalian tissue, or did you have to get special permission to do this due to an emergency? The, that's why we're, you're, we are pretty interested in, um, in the compost content, especially the nutrient value. The counties in Minnesota, the counties are the ones responsible for kind of determining the, the land uh, nutrient rate spread, rate of spread. Um, so we worked with the counties um, who were more interested in what was going on there. Um, they did, LeSueur County had to pass a special ordinance for this to go through. Um, their county commissioners met at a special meeting to work through this and pass this. This was sort of a one-time deal in LeSueur County. Nobles County had no such regulations, and although we worked through the county commissioners to develop the site, um, there were no legal issues that we faced um, there. With the high water table in Minnesota, was there any concern about generated leachate, which is high in biological oxygen demand, mobilizing metals into the groundwater? Yeah, there is always that concern. Um, when I talk about the absorption of the body fluids, um, that really helps kind of reduce that leachate amount Back in our February trial, we actually went to, we dug um, wells underneath all of the piles, and we measured that leachate as it was coming out. Um, there are I, I don't have the results in front of me, but they are um, you know they were very clean. I would say, obviously, we were really looking for whether virus would come out um, in, in the leachate, and we did not find that to be an issue. The other question concerned with that is, were any groundwater monitoring wells installed to ensure the site did not impact groundwater quality? We did not do that at this time, but I think if we had, um, I think that might allay some of the concerns from the neighbors. I think that might be um, a good idea to do, should we do this again? I, I think that we would probably make that investment. Okay. Do we have any verbal questions in the queue? Uh, we do have one verbal question in the queue. Would you like me to take it? Let's go ahead and take that, yep. All right, no problem. Call your line has been unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Dave Thompson from Michigan State University. I'm curious about the PFAS. Um, do, do you know where it came from? Did it come in with the wood chips or was it already on the site? 
and is it an issue that is likely to uh, pop up in other places? It, it, was it was it present at both sites? Thanks for that question, and I'm going to have to um, defer uh, for a couple months on that one. We haven't taken our samples yet for the PFAS. Um, there, there is a question of whether or not they're coming in on the wood chips themselves, whether they are coming in um, through the animals, um, through the animal feed sort of thing. Um, we're not quite sure if they are present in this compost, and we'll have to test them to, make, to see if they are even here. Um, and then we can kind of trace back to see where they might be coming from. So I'm sorry, I don't have a very good answer for you now. That, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just glad to hear you're working on it because I think that's that's a very important observation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to have to close off for the day. But just for everybody else that has put questions in the chat, um, Lucy will get these questions at the end of the um, webinar and she can address those questions as, as long as your email is in there attached to it. So the last question is how long is a typical composting cycle? And do you use the compost from the completed piles to give a jump start for new piles? Um, the typical range of the compost pile um, is about four to six weeks. Um, summer in Minnesota brings us a lot of drenching thunderstorms, so there were a few days where we could not get into turn piles when they were on the clock to be turned. Um, so. It was, uh, you know, variable. But four to six weeks is a good range for how long it takes. And I think that's pretty amazing when we're talking about reducing, you know, 20,000 um, carcasses to nothing in that short of a period. Um, as far as the reusing of the, of the carbon, I think that's definitely a, a possibility for the future. This is something that we learned this time around. Um, we had that problem in February where the piles didn't reduce as much as we thought because those wood chips were still pretty big and thick and, and did not compost as quickly. Um, at, that, at that time, however, we thought that it was just because the piles dried out too fast. Um, but I think that we'll definitely consider reusing the, the, um, the carbon sources, one, and we can, might even be able to run them through twice. So that would be a great way to reduce those um, carbon source costs. Okay, well with that, I'm gonna say thank you for everybody's participation. As I stated before, the questions that were not answered in the chat will be given to Lucy um, once we're done and I get the report back in the next day. Um, and on behalf of the National Training and Exercise Program, I'd also like to thank Lucy for presenting today. There's a lot of great comments in the chat about what a great presentation it was and how informational it was. Um, so, And our next webinar, just to advertise that, um, it's going to be held on August 4th, and the topic is going to be international impacts and expectations related to exports of animals and animal products. Um, and also, as I say in every, at the end of every webinar, if you have any ideas for webinars that the National Training and Exercise Program can explore for our emergency preparedness community, please feel free to contact us. And you will find the recorded webinar on various topics on the NTEP video gallery, which I posted that site, um, on the, um, which is on the APHIS website. I posted it in the chat. And if anybody has any questions, you can always contact me. And with that, I just want to say have a great afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhance. You may now disconnect.